Well, let's pray um, as we get started and get a look at the word and we'll try to persevere for a little bit and then we'll, all right, so y'all, let's, let's pray through this and we'll see what the Lord has to say. Father, thank you today <clears throat> for the privilege to come. Uh, we do thank you again for, yes, Lord, you are faithful. You are, <laughs> you, you've been more faithful than we deserve, Lord. We thank you for that. And right now we just come and we just ask you to bless our time. Uh, may you speak, encourage, and just do what you do, Father. We are just grateful for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, if you will open your Bibles again to the book of Jude. Uh, that's the book of Jude. As we kind of resume and kind of pick up from where we were last week, uh, that's the book of Jude. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 20. Let me get my screen going here. Yes, the book of Jude, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 20, okay? And the scripture reads, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ until eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, so now as you recall, we're kind of going to pick up where we were last week and we will end this point uh, talking about uh, where now it goes into the encouragement. And as we looked at this time of the false teacher, but we, was, we were talking about this issue but we called it, you don't have to stumble, okay? You don't have to stumble. Because go back, we'll go back to verse 17. Let's read that. He says, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. And so we we're talking about this issue you don't have to stumble. Now, if you recall, okay, here we go. Um, you know, before this point, we were talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we read verses 14 and 15. You know, the scripture talks about how the natural man doesn't understand the things of God, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And we talked about that Greek word, uh, sukikos. It's called sukikos. It's, it's, it means soulish, okay? Uh, remember, we talked about souls and soulless ministry. And it takes us to this point uh, where we said that one of the tragedies today is that God's church can't discern between true ministry and soul ministry or soulish ministry. In other words, uh, they can't tell the difference between someone who who is Holy Spirit led versus someone who's operating in the flesh, okay? Also, and we talked about this issue of religious showmanship. Remember we went to Leviticus chapter 10 and we talked about Nadab and Abihu who offered the false fire before the Lord. And as a result, God killed them. And we looked at the re part of, you know, the reasons why God was displeased, of course, because they didn't come properly into the tabernacle, but it also, uh, as God began to talk to uh, Aaron, you get to talk to him about the whole issue of alcohol and drink. So it appears that maybe Nadab and Abihu may have came to the tabernacle um, intoxicated. And we talked about the whole issue of, you know, how God is serious about how we handle his business, his pulpit, how we handle his word. He is serious about it. And, she, and it shows there how serious he was about it because of how he dealt with Nadab and Abihu, okay? Because they offered the false fire. And then we talked today, we also talked about the false fire that's happening today in the church. You know, there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, what appears to be, people are calling it a work of God, but in a lot of cases, it's false. And the reason why I say it's false, and I believe that it's false, is because if what we really saw happening within, in the walls was real, I believe we see more effectiveness outside the walls. Because the church universal, you just don't see 
an effectiveness outside the walls. There's a lot of stuff happening inside the walls, but you don't see any effectiveness outside the walls, okay? False fire, okay? So, so now, how do we discern between the soulish and the spiritual, all right? How do we do that? And we talked about this also. This is still review. Remember, we talked about using the word of God. Hebrews 4.12, the scripture says, you know, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We use the word of God, all right? Secondly, we talk about paying attention to the witness of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about that, how the Holy Spirit is a witness. Uh, Romans 8.16 the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And we talked about that issue, how um, many times uh, you, can, you can run into someone that you've never met before and that person's a believer and you begin to talk to them. And because there's a witness of the Holy Spirit between the two of you, you just know that person's operating in the control of the Holy Spirit. And it's the same thing by someone who is who is operating in a soulish ministry versus a spiritual ministry. There ought to be a witness between you and that person that they're operating in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is leading and guiding them, okay? Excuse me one second, excuse me. Okay, so. So now, the other way that you know that operating in soulish ministry is that soulish ministry magnifies man, okay? Now, if you recall last week, uh, that video we looked at, okay, remember we talked about this, um, one of the parts in that video dealing with Joel Osteen, he remember he was with, with Oprah, and he stood up in front of all those people, and then he said, he said, and he started using the word I. I can do this, I can be that, I can do this, and I can walk in it. Everything was I. There was no Jesus in it at all. Soulless ministry. Remember, we talked about that, and we saw it in the video. Soulless ministry magnifies man. When it's all about man, that's what you see. When somebody operating in the flesh, all right? But the Holy Spirit will always glorify Jesus. Someone is operating According to the Holy Spirit, they're being led by the Holy Spirit. They're going to point people to Jesus. Jesus will be magnified. He will be glorified in the midst. Okay. As we saw last week, you didn't see Jesus lifted up. It was all about, uh, 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 you know, uh, um, uh, prosperity, you know, uh, you know, TV Jacks talking about him and Oprah talking about, you know, what they drive because you got a plane and all that stuff. And, it, you know, it's this. That's what it is. It's, it's soulish ministry. And I'm not saying it's wrong to have that. If the Lord gives it to you, okay. But listen, the, 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 the sole purpose of those ministries is that they want to preach uh, uh, prospering in the Lord. Prosper. Okay? But I don't think that, that, that the prosperity of uh, the people of God is first on God's list. I think God's holiness is first on God's list. Okay? He wants his people holy. He says, be holy above all things. That's what I want, okay? Now, now back to this point. Uh, when, when the Holy Spirit is glorified, he's glorifying Jesus, there's going to be edification of the body of Christ, all right? And that word edification means people will be built up. They will be encouraged in the faith, all right? There'll be challenged as well because, of, because part of being, uh, being built up is sometimes to be challenged. And, and part of the challenge is, the Lord is saying, okay, where you are right now, no, we got to move beyond that. That's part of edification, to, to build up, to encourage, all right? Okay? There'll be edification. Also, it takes the Spirit of God to minister to our spirits and make us more like Jesus. Okay? The Holy Spirit's got to do that. Because the Holy Spirit, many times, has got to pull us out of where we are. Because, you know, we... We, as believers, sometimes if we're not careful, we can get uh, settled. You know, the Lord doesn't call us to settle. He calls us to press. So sometimes the Holy Spirit, I come, wait a minute, where you are right now? No, no, you got to get out of there. Come on, get moving. Get moving, okay? He takes the Spirit of God 
to minister to our spirits and make us more like Jesus, okay? Now, soulless ministry will manufacture experiences. Because let's face it, in most places like that, that's what people are chasing. They come to get. They come to get some kind of experience. I mean, you've heard people come and say, I'm coming to get my blessing, whatever that is, you know. But many times they associate it with some type of euphoric, um, uh, you know, manifestation, something. I'm coming to get something. And nobody talks about what, what does the Lord want from me? What does he want? No, so this ministry will manufacture experiences, okay? It's about entertainment. Um, we set it up so people can come in and be entertained. And let's be real about it. Uh, a lot of what we see happening now in the church, it's, it's scary and it's troublesome because you even see now where uh, what we call emerging churches, you know, in a lot of places, um, when you enter that place, it doesn't even look like a church. It looks like a nightclub. It's got light shows. They got smoke shows. Why? It's all about entertainment. It's entertainment first, okay? Let's manufacture experiences. Also, they may have something to tickle the, tickle the, the mind, but nothing to really challenge, all right? Intellectual education. That's what soulless ministry will do, okay? Entertain and maybe do a little intellectual education. Okay, now, now, when we talked about this last week, the Christian life must never stand still, okay? We have not been saved to stand still. Paul said, I press, I press toward the mark. We always ought to be moving, pressing forward, always pressing to grow in Christ, okay? Because, listen, if you begin to stand still, you're actually going to fall back. Listen, we haven't been saved to stand still. We have been saved to press forward, to grow in Christ, to be better, to look more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Now, the whole issue of the illustration of a house, if you have a house that's left to itself, it's going to fall apart. Anybody know who's a homeowner, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you own a house, if you just leave it alone and don't do anything, it's going to fall apart. <laughs> You probably know what I'm talking about, right? You guys constantly got to be taking care of it, maintaining it. You got to, you, you, you know, it's stuff to do, right? It's just like our, our, our life in Christ. He doesn't leave us. He, does, he says, no, 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 no. That's why the Holy Spirit's always messing with us. That's why he's always messing with us. Because listen, we got to tend to stuff. We got this sin we got to confess and, 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 and forsake. Why? Because we got to be better. We got to be moving forward. The idea is to move forward. Okay. Now, we look at the whole issue of the apostates, the whole idea of the apostate, the false teacher. The, apost the false teacher, the apostate are in the business of tearing down. That's what they come to do. That's why they rise up. That's why they fall away. And as I said, we've said weeks back that just because they fall away doesn't mean they, that they leave the church. The reason why they stay is because they want to tear the church down. Okay. Now, the Christian must be involved in building up first, all right? Then what does he build? He builds his own, he builds his own spiritual life, and then he builds into the life of others. I make sure I'm building me up, and then I build somebody else up. Because remember, remember the whole idea of, of, of being a part of the body of Christ is that we come alongside, come behind somebody else, and they might need a push. They might need encouragement. Why? Because we're all at different levels spiritually. So we got to come alongside each other. Hey, come on. Keep going. Keep going. I see you struggling. Come on. Come on. Let me help you walk with you. Come on. Keep going. We build each other. We build each other. We build up each other. Okay? Now, what is the foundation for the Christian? As we're still talking about building the Christian life, as verse 20 talks about, okay? Building yourselves up on your most holy faith. We're talking about building the Christian life. What is the foundation for the Christian? The first foundation is something called faith, our most holy faith. Verse 20 talks about that, okay? Building yourselves up on your most holy 
faith. Okay, let's read some scripture now. Go to go to First Corinthians chapter three. Okay, First Corinthians chapter three. Mm. Okay. At verse 11. In fact, I'm going to go back to verse 9. I'll start at verse 9. He says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. And I'll stop there. But the whole idea of building a foundation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Start, I'll start at 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer, stra no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit, okay? Now, our, the first thing we look at is this whole issue of our faith. Now, faith is based upon our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Secondly, we base it on what God has revealed in his word, all right? That great verse, 2 Timothy 3.16, you know, uh, you know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be equipped, <laughs> okay? It has to be based, our foundation has to be based upon what God has said in his word, all right? Not what man has said, not what Bishop so-and-so said, it is based upon what God has said in his word, okay? It's based upon his word. Now, also, now, this Chinese preacher by the name of Watchman Nee reads through the entire New Testament once per month. Think about that. Once a month, he reads 37 books. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he reads the books of the New Testament. Okay. Now, the philosophy of the Chinese church no Bible, no breakfast. That means the word of God is so important that before I feed my flesh, I'm going to feed my spirit. No Bible, no breakfast. That's a good philosophy to have. It really is. I think it's part of Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Hey, I'm seeking the Lord uh, first thing in the morning. I'm seeking the Lord. Okay, no Bible. No breakfast. How many want to try that? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I've been trying to do that. And sometimes I, I, I feel convicted when I, if, if, if I think about eating something and I haven't read the word, I do. So now I, that's, I try to do that. Listen, let me just open the word first, see what the Lord has to say this morning. Okay. No Bible, no breakfast. 
Okay. Okay. Now, let's talk a minute about the power of building the Christian life. The power of building the Christian life. Okay. Now, what's the first thing we talk about? Prayer. Do we understand how powerful prayer is and how necessary it is in each individual life? And listen, in the life of a church. Prayer is so powerful and it's so necessary. Prayer, okay? The word of God and prayer go together. Because many times we, 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 we want the word, but we don't want to pray. No, the word of God and prayer go together. You know, uh, <clears throat> minister, mm -hmm. uh, we know that the devil hates when sent when Christians pray. Absolutely. He hates it. So when I first heard that, I said, oh, I'm going to be praying more. Since he hates it, I'm going to be praying more. Absolutely. And today in my study <clears throat> with Charles Stanley, he's been talking about prayer mm -hmm. and how important it is and how Satan hates, hates it when we pray. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's a weapon. It is a, mm -hmm. one of the weapons of our warfare. The scripture yep. says it. Weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And one of the weapons is prayer. Mm -hmm. It's prayer. When you bow the knees of your heart and go before the throne of grace, oh my goodness. Yeah. That's where, that's where the Satan. battle is won. <laughs> yeah. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Yes. I heard that a long time ago. Never forgot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And listen, listen, listen. While we're here, let me just say this. We just came out of April. We had the hour of power, okay? Do you understand the power that a church can, uh, the effectiveness we can see within, a, within an assembly when the people of God when, when can, can come together with one mind together and seek God together? When you can get a church to do that, do you know what God can do in our midst? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I can't see everybody now since I'm in my share screen, but I don't know how many of you participated, but I'm telling you, if you didn't, because we're coming back in June to do it again, come on and get on. Do you know what God will do in the midst of Genesis? If you could get the people of God would have one mind to seek God mm -hmm. together. Yep. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes, because the word of God and prayer go together. Yes. They go together. Now, see, we get word. We get word. All right. In fact, let me show you this. I was going to do this later. I'm going to do it right now. Let me show you this. I don't know. If, I don't know. I don't know if I did this one time before. But look at this. This thing just burned my heart. One day I was, I was down here in my office and I pulled all these books out. These, these books. See all these books? This represents about maybe almost 20 years where it's a preaching and teaching. Notes, messages, Bible studies. And I looked at all of this and I said, we are equipped. Okay, so why, why, why isn't Genesis soaring? There's a couple of reasons. It's because we gotta pray and we gotta have a heart to be obedient. See, it can't just be about getting a word we got to seek the Lord about how he would have us use it in our lives. Look at this. We are equipped. Look at this. Yes. <laughs> we're without excuse. We're without excuse. excuse. We're without excuse. No doubt. No doubt. And that's not mm -hmm. all the books. That's no, just it's not. Because I got I stuff in my file cabinets, too. This yeah, is not everything. <laughs> this is not everything. But when I looked at it, it burdened my heart. It really did. It just burdened my heart. Mm -hmm. And, and, mm -hmm. And, and I, just, I just think that's why the prayer time as a church family is so important. It's so important because the word of God mm -hmm. and prayer go together. Amen. Okay? Mm -hmm. They go together mm -hmm. right now. Now, look at, look at this. The word without prayer means light with no power. Mm -hmm. Look at that. 
I'm gonna let that sit there, man. You gotta meditate on that. Look, the word without prayer means light with no power. And we got the word, but part of the power comes from uh, praying about what God has shown us. Lord, show me how. It means light with no power. Okay? I'm going to let that sit there just for a minute. <laughs> Okay, so now look at this. Prayer without the word means zeal without knowledge. See, the two go together. That's the whole idea. The point is the two go together, okay? Got to have both. Need the word, but we also need prayer. Prayer without the word means zeal without knowledge. Now, another way that we that we uh, build the Christian wife is we read the word to grow in faith. Okay, you know Romans ten seventeen, uh, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what the word of God. Okay, faith comes by hearing. We read the word to grow in faith. Now, we use faith to pray according to what God has said. That's the whole idea of faith. We 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 grasp what God has already said. Okay, we not um, well, let me read this statement and we'll talk about it. Faith means to stand on what God has already said. And secondly, praying in faith doesn't move God. It moves me to where he is. True faith embraces what God has already said. I line up with what he said. I embrace what he said. I trust what he said. Because, you know, there's a teaching out now. It's false. It's wrong. It's unbiblical. And it was a renowned gospel singer who said this. He said, my faith moves God. In other words, I can move God around by what I say and what I believe. No, no. Real faith means I find out where he is and I line up with where he is. I embrace what he said. I trust what he said. And, and real faith means I may not understand it, but because God said it, I trust him. That's where I am. A renowned gospel singer said that my faith moves God. Where did folks get this stuff? <laughs> where did they get it from? This is the idea of what real faith is. Praying in faith doesn't move God. It moves me to where he is. Okay? It moves me to where he is. And you know, if you, if you ever take a minute and go uh, and look at the Garden of Gethsemane, um, that's just a great illustration of that. And here's Jesus uh, struggling for a moment in his humanity because he looked in that cup of indignation and saw what was about to happen. And he's struggling. Now, in one minute, he's asking the Lord to take it away. And the very next verse, there's a nevertheless. He says, nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will. Now, that's what faith does. It lines up with the will of God. It trusts what God said. That's a, I think that's just the excellent picture of it, okay? It lines up with what God has said. It moves me to where he is, okay? Is that, is that similar, Minister Rob, to uh, that saying that prayer, you know, people used to always say prayer changes things, but then I heard someone several, a few years after that, say prayer changes me. That's exactly right. That's the real thing. Prayer changes me. Because listen, if you ever had a time of prayer, and you go into that prayer and you're thinking one way. And while you're praying, the Lord shifts your whole thinking about it. And then while you're praying, you just see, okay, Lord, I was wrong about it. I, I was seeing this wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> that's, that's what, but that's what prayer is supposed to do. It's supposed to line my heart up with where God is. That's the whole idea. It lines me up. Okay? That's the whole idea. Praying according to what God has said. Okay? Now. Now. For a minute, let's talk a minute about this whole idea. In verse 20, he talks about praying in the Holy Spirit, okay? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, now, if, go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, chapter 6. Okay. 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, the scripture says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, excuse me, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, okay? Now, this whole idea of praying in the spirit, now, what exactly is that? First off, all prayer, he says, praying, as he says, praying always with all prayer. All prayer focuses on the variety of prayers, okay? You know, there are many requests, just like what we do. You know, we take prayer requests on Wednesday, and we pray about that, okay? All prayer, all right? It focuses on the variety of prayers. And then he uses the word always, praying always with all prayer. Always focuses on the frequency of prayer, okay? Because really... <laughs> Okay, this whole idea of always, because um, you know, scripture says man ought to always pray, not think. So the idea is that we are in an attitude of prayer all the time. You know, you're driving your car, and, you know, you think something comes to your mind, and of course, don't close your eyes, but you know, you can still pray with your eyes open <laughs> while you're driving, though. But that's the idea. Wherever you are, you're in an attitude of prayer, you're praying in the Holy Spirit, okay? focuses on the frequency of prayer. Also, he says, in the spirit. Now, in the whole idea of in the spirit, it focuses on submission as we line up with the will of God, okay? Because remember, that goes back to what we just talked about, how uh, even with Jesus in the garden, that's, that's what happened with him. He submitted to the will of the Father as he was praying. It's the same picture. We line up with the will of God as we pray. I, when I'm praying, the Lord shows me the will of God. My heart is postured to line up with what he says. I line up with the will of God, okay, in the spirit. Okay. Now, it is not a call to some ecstatic form of prayer. Because, you know, some have taken that verse to mean, you know, because there's some who teach that, you know, you ought to have a prayer language, you know. In other words, they're talking about tongues, okay? That's not what it's talking about. It has nothing to do with that. Um, they say when you pray in the spirit and you pray in your tongue, you do that so that, so that the devil doesn't know what you're praying about. I mean, that's what they talk, that's what they say. That's that kind of stuff that's out there, okay? All right, but that's not what that verse is saying, okay? That's not what he's saying. It is not a call to some ecstatic form of prayer. That's not what he's talking about, okay? It is a call to pray consistently in the will and power of the Spirit. In other words, it is Holy Spirit-led, right? Because there are times that the Lord can lay stuff and the Holy Spirit will bring back to your remembrance some people you need to pray about and, and some issues, and, and, and the Lord does that, you know? And even while you're praying, it brings stuff to your memories that you need to pray about, some names you need to call out and in the will and the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? Okay, and then just talk about what we just talked about, praying according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. The praying according to the leading of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> okay? Now, look at this statement. Prayer is not getting man's will done in heaven, but it is getting God's will done on earth. That's what prayer is. It is not getting man's will done in heaven, but it is getting God's will done on earth. Because it's not about me uh, just lifting up what I want. You know, God, you do this and Lord, you do that and you do this. No, no, no. Prayer is, let me, let me, let me. Uh, allow the Lord to speak to my heart, even through prayer, so that so I line up with what He wants done here. I'm lining up, so God's will is done here on earth. Okay, <clears throat> it is not getting man's will done in heaven, but it is getting God's will done on earth. Okay, that's what true prayer is. Okay, now go to First John. 
chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. First John chapter 5, 14 and 15. Okay, and the scripture says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him, okay? okay again, we're talking about praying in the Holy Spirit now, okay? In other words, I will pray in accordance to what God would want. I'm praying in accordance to what God would want. Okay, I'm finding out what he wants. And see, um, I think people read this verse and they forget the according to his will part. Okay, he says, if I ask anything, he's going to do it. No, no, no. He says, according to his will. Wait, we leave that part out. No, no, no. When we pray, we have to find out what his will is. And if we're praying according to his will, the verse says, he hears us. And if we ask according to his will, we know we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Why? Because God can grant it because my heart is lined up with his will. Okay? It's not what we insist what God would do for us. It is praying according to what God would want. Right? Also, Holy Spirit praying isn't self-centered prayer. Because it can't be all about me all the time. If it's really Holy Spirit led, as I said before, the Lord's going to, the Holy Spirit's going to lay stuff on my heart to pray about for other people and other issues. And, and I may not even get mentioned in the prayer. It's not self-centered prayer. Okay. And that's what people, and, and people are being fooled into thinking that's all it is now. You know, Lord, I, I speak this into my life and I want this and, you know, I'm, I'm speaking that because and I'm speaking this blessing in my life and because I'm speaking it, you're obligated to do it. No, 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 that's not Holy Spirit led. It's unbiblical as well. I mean, people who say that, do you really realize who you're talking to? When you say that, Lord, I speak it, so you're obligated to do it. Do they really realize who they're talking to? <laughs> you know, it's not self-centered prayer, okay? Here we go. Prayer will line up with the will of God. If it's Holy Spirit led, it's going to line up with the will of God. Okay, now, also, this whole idea of praying in a closet, you know, you go in your closet and you close your door, wherever your, your area of prayer is. And I, you know, I hope that everybody has an area where they can go to pray. You know, it's important to have a spot where you can go, you know, just have quiet time. It could be a corner where it is, but you have a spot where you can go and pray. Okay. Now, Matthew chapter six talks about that. You know, we go in our closet, our prayer closet. Now, you know, the Lord's there with us. Also, um, Romans chapter eight, verses 26 through 28, he talks about in verse 27, this whole issue of the mind of the spirit, okay? The mind of the spirit. In fact, turn that, go to Romans 8. Let's read those verses real quick. Romans chapter 8. He says, beginning at verse 26, he says, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we are, but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are, who are the called according to his purpose, okay? Now, he talks in verse 27 about this issue of the mind of the spirit. Now, now, when we talk about this issue, first of all, the father agrees with 
and understands what the spirit thinks. And why? Because the, the, the Godhead operates as one. There's no disorder or, you know, or dysfunction in the Godhead. They function as one, okay? And by the way, that's how marriage is supposed to look. You know, I had to throw that in there, right? But anyway, I go back. <laughs> but the father agrees with and understands what the spirit thinks, all right? They don't want to call the mind of the spirit. Now, again, the whole idea is that when we pray, the Holy Spirit directs our prayers. The Holy Spirit directs our prayer. And it's probably a real test for you all of us when we pray um, to make sure we are praying in the spirit is after we finish praying, think about what you just prayed about. If all I did was talk about me, then maybe it wasn't Holy Spirit then. Okay? It's just a you know, way to examine how I pray. Was it really Holy Spirit led? Okay? Now, now, what is the work of the Holy Spirit when we pray, okay? Go to the book of Ephesians, chapter one. We'll probably be here a few minutes, so. Uh, Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one. Okay. Beginning at verse 15. Uh, he says, therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, okay? He, when we pray, part of what happens through prayer is that we obtain wisdom. And also there are times that we get enlightenment, okay? The things we're praying about and through that prayer, many times the Lord will give us enlightenment on that issue. Okay, he'll give us enlightenment on an issue, even through prayer, okay? And that's the whole issue of where uh, wisdom comes from. That's where discernment comes from, where we begin to really understand what's true versus what's false, all right? <clears throat> he gives us wisdom, and he gives us wild, our knowledge. Now, and, and just, just stop for a minute what wisdom really is. W wisdom really means to, under to properly understand what I know. Because remember, when we were talking about the why prayer is necessary with the word, this is part, this is a good picture of it. Um, when you pray and ask the Lord to show you how to use them, use it, that's where wisdom comes from. It means to properly use what I know. How do I obtain that? By prayer. The work of the Holy Spirit. I'm asking the Lord to enlighten me, to show me how to use what I just got. Gives us wisdom. Minister Mosley, unmute yourself. Ah, okay, thank you. I must have hit it by mistake. Okay, um, thank you. But again, I go, I'll go back and say what I said in case you didn't get it, but the whole idea of wisdom, um, the whole idea of wisdom is uh, to understand how to properly use what you know, okay? That's what wisdom is. In other words, and it goes back to what we were talking about, um, <clears throat> not just getting the word, but praying about what we got. So we understand how to properly use it. That's what wisdom is. And all of that happens through prayer. God enlightens us through prayer. That's what Paul is saying. He says, he said, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Okay, you see that. Okay, so when we're praying, he reminds us of the word of God. Brings back to your word. The, while you're praying, you're praying back the promises of God, what God said. Because many times we we need to we need that for us. We're praying about something we're troubled about, and the Lord's reminding me through prayer. That's what I said. This is what I said. I said this. I'm saying it back to the Lord, but He's working on me while I'm praying. 
You know, that's what, that's what he does. He reminds us of the word of God, okay? Also, he helps us with access to the Father. Go to chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 18. Okay, verse 18, the scripture says in chapter 2, for through him, we both have access by what? One spirit to the Father. You see that he gives us access to the Father, right? When we pray, remember, he is like the go-between. You know, he takes those groaning stuff that we can't even. We read that in Romans eight stuff. Sometimes we got stuff on our heart we can't even bring it to words, and the Holy Spirit takes that, takes it before the throne. Okay, helps us with access to the Father. Also, we worship in prayer through the Spirit. Okay. Because, you know, part of prayer is worship. You know, if you, you know, if you, when you pray, when you pray. Um, and before, when we go before the Lord, we realize who he is, you know, we ascribe worship to his name. I mean, you think about that, do I, do I just jump right in or I say, wait a minute, you know, Lord, I thank you. I, I realize who you are. You're great. You're awful. You're, you're awesome. You're, you're off. I don't know why I can't talk now. You're awesome. <laughs> I couldn't get the word out. Okay. Um, you're awesome in all your ways. And sometimes when you go through ascribing worship to him, the issue you were going to him about probably is not as serious as you thought it was. Because now his picture of who he is is expanding now because I have worshiped him through prayer. Okay. Philippians chapter three, verse three. He says, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Do you see that? He says, we worship God in the spirit, okay? Attitude of prayer and attitude of worship, or attitude of worship when we pray, okay? We worship him when we pray. Now, when the believer is yielded to the spirit, the spirit will assist him in his prayer life and God will answer according to his will because the Holy Spirit is going to help my prayer to line up with the will of God. That's like that verse in Psalm 37, you know, delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. If, if I'm delighting in him, if my heart is lined up with him, then, then his desires become my desires. So now he can answer because it's according to his will. Okay. When he is yielded to the spirit, the spirit's going to assist him in his prayer life and God will answer according to his will. Okay, now, now the building process involves some things, okay? The, in terms of building the Christian life, it involves some things. Now, it involves, first of all, as we talked about the word of God, the word is essential. The word of God. Secondly, the spirit of God. And thirdly, prayer. We must have prayer. The word of God, the spirit of God, and we must have prayer. Prayer. Okay. Now, there's another fact. Okay, in verse 21, back in Jude, go back to Jude. <clears throat> he says, he begins to talk about in verse 21 of Jude. He says, uh, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, this whole idea of keeping or abiding in God's love, okay, keeping. Um, now, that word keeping or abiding, it means to remain stable or fixed. The whole idea, I am, I have taken a seat in the Lord, okay? I'm going to abide, I'm going to remain, I'm fixed. I am fixed. In the place that he would have me, I am fixed. Because unlike the, the apostate, I'm not going anywhere. Okay, I'm fixed. 
Okay? That's the whole idea of abiding or keeping myself in the love of God. I am going to remain stable or fixed. Okay? Also, I'm going to be obedient to what he said. Part of abiding means to be obedient to what he said. Okay? Also, now the building process for a body. There's a couple of verses here. I think I'll give you these and then we'll probably stop before my voice gives out. <laughs> the Lord's been gracious. Okay. John 15, verse 9. He says, the scripture says, to continue in my love. Okay. Because you know the whole issue of uh, John 15, you know, is the issue, the issue of a body. Okay. Also, 1 John 2 5. But whoever keeps my word, keeps his word. Truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him, okay? We are in him. John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, okay? John 15, 9. Continue in my love. 1 John 2, 5. Um, keep his word. John 15, 10, keep his commandments. That's the process for building the life. And we'll stop here. I'm going to stop here. I got, a, I got another little video I'm going to show you, okay? Another little video I'm going to show you real, right now. And um, then we'll, you know, and after that, we'll maybe we'll talk a few minutes, okay? So we'll stop here and then I'll show this video. And then we'll do that, all right? Okay. Now. I want to show you this. To our holy God. Listen to what he says. Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. You, you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. In other words, God, here's what God desires and God delights in, and yet against you I've sinned. Notice he didn't say against Bathsheba I've sinned. Against Uriah I have sinned. No, against you, God, and ultimately against you only I have sinned. Because who was Uriah but the man that you created? Who was Bathsheba but the servant of the Most High God? I sinned against a holy and a righteous God. And that's what worries me about the shack. That's what worries me about the raw bells of the world. That's what worries me about those who don't want to preach on sin because people already know that they're bad. No, we don't. No, we don't. We watch the nightly news and we think those people are bad. Not us. We don't recognize that we have sinned against the holy and righteous God. We don't get that. We don't see that. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 19. I just love this. Maybe it says something about my character. I despise the picture that's painted in our culture of this sissified, needy Jesus. Amen? And that's who he is. He's a sissified, needy Jesus. He's just yearning for you. He's longing for you. He wants friendship and relationship with you. He needs you. Oh, you're breaking his heart. No, he's going to break you. Newsflash, by definition, God is self-sustaining, self-existent, and self-sufficient. Therefore, by definition, he needs nothing. God does not need you, and he's going to prove it one day because you're going to die, and the world's going to keep on spinning at the same rate it was before you were here, and somebody's going to get all your stuff.
He's waiting for you all right. <laughs> Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. Then I saw heaven open to behold a white horse, the one sitting on it called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. He judges and makes war. It's my God. Yeah, I've got some issues, but that's all right. <laughs> his eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's my Jesus. That's the God whom I serve. Not the sissified Christ that's preached in pulpits around the United States of America. I serve the great God of the universe who gets angry and pours out his wrath. I serve the great God of the universe who demonstrated his wrath when he poured it out on his own son. And it amazes me that we believe this, that God would crush and kill his own son but let you slide. Mm. Not for a minute. The spotless, sinless Lamb of God suffered and bled and died because of the wrath of God. That propitiation, the satisfaction of the righteous wrath of God, that's what was experienced on the cross. How dare we take that lightly? That's the one against whom you've sinned. Mama. <laughs> I just wanted to show you that. Let's pray, we'll close out and then we'll talk. Father, thank you for our time, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for even this brother, Lord. Thank you for his, his mm -hmm. to, to stand flat-footed and preach your word. Uh, thank you, Father. We pray, God, that you might just encourage every heart. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. That, um, uh, got me through it, this, this lesson. Lord. Thank you, Father. We're just grateful. So we honor you today for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Prayer, and then we'll get started this afternoon. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have joy this evening because of your faithfulness. You are faithful. And as the scriptures say, even when we are unfaithful, you are faithful because you cannot deny yourself. We thank you again for the privilege of coming together as a body, though scattered out but close together because of your presence with us where we are because you are omnipresent God. We thank you again for the tender mercy and love and kindness that you have shown toward us and having kept us and answered our prayers as we last gathered together. We thank you for your great love that you have shown toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ just by believing on his name. And so you make it possible for us to have joy. Yes, to even be faithful. Because even as he overcome death in the grave and was raised the third day and ascended to thy right hand, he sent the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, who can cause us to be faithful as we yield our will to his will. So we pray, Lord, this evening that each heart would be yielded to the Holy Spirit, that he would guide us into some spiritual truths that might encourage us along the way. Our purpose, Lord, of coming together is to encourage one another, to exhort one another in this Christian walk and run that we have, each one of us racing together, but have a separate finish line. We want to finish great, and we want to finish with goodness, 
and tender mercy and love and kindness as our God. We thank you again for each one who have, you have assembled here. Again, we pray that the Holy Spirit will illuminate our hearts and minds and that he would cause this person who are weak would be clear in his presentation that it would be known and hear it by, you, by the ears of your saints and servants and that, you, that they have been in the presence of, of you and not just me because you are again faithful God. Your promise to feed us with the word of God if we yield our will to your will. So bless our time together tonight. What is in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm going to, uh, of course, I'm sharing my screen. And I think this time, at least you can hear me <laughs> before I get started. I'm trying to do this. We're going to be, again, continuing in our study. We will not be silenced by Dr. Edward Lutzer. And we're going to be on a different subject tonight. We're going to be looking at propaganda, how propaganda can be used to direct the nation, to, to use to direct the nation. Yes, it can. And I think uh, many of us can have a very experience with propaganda. We know how it works. We've been a victim of it. And in some instances, we have le learned lessons from it. And so tonight, if you have your Bible, open with me to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15. And just be prepared. We're going to start there, but we're going to look at some things before we start there. But uh, we'll be reading from 2 Samuel chapter 15. We'll read verses 1 through 12. As in, again, this is a Bible study, although we are looking at and using as a resource Edward Luce's book, We Will Not Be Silenced. He covered many biblical principles. Remember, remember, remember many, many, many. Uh, uh, experiences and, 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 and whatnot, but he has done what I call the spade work in the application part of the scripture. But you and I, we live by, we do not live by bread alone. But we live by every word that, 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 that is given to us from the word of God, Deuteronomy chapter eight and also Matthew chapter four. So let's begin tonight by looking at uh, our, our screen here. We will look at uh, this particular pyramid of capital, called the pyramid of capitalist system. And this has to do with propaganda, propaganda. And so Dr. Luther, he says that propaganda can change. He's absolutely right. Can change the direction of a nation. We're going to see how that works. Even, 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 even a nation, a God's, a nation of God's people. Propaganda can change the direction of a nation, Dr. Ebelusa proclaimed. And of course, uh, we're going to look at this pyramid here that has a little bit to do with what, what he's talking about. This, this particular uh, pyramid was, was, is a photo from 1911. American cartoons, American cartoon characters, which criticized capitalism, was widely reproduced. And distributed. Now note these. Note this particular propaganda uh, pyramid scheme. Scheme it has here at the top, which is truthful capitalism. I, I guess I got the. Can't, you can't see all of it, but this is money, and this is capitalism. Now the the object of propaganda, of course, is to uh, put in bad light something that uh, that uh, perhaps uh, is not necessarily true. Well, in fact, it's not true. We're going to talk about what the definition of propaganda is. But uh, anyway, he, he, he starts here. He said, okay, this is, this is an anti-capitalist uh, system uh, pyramid scheme. It, this, this is what he says. He's, who, the, 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 the person who created this work said that money is, 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 the, is the capitalist system aim and that it rules the system. And, it's, and, uh, and, then, and then Marxism says that uh, really religion was, was invented. I'm using Karl Marx's words, and not, maybe, maybe, maybe don't hold me to a direct quote, but he says that his, and his principle is that religion was invented to, to uphold capitalism. That's what he said. You can, you can look up his writings, you'll see that he, because he was anti-God. But and now, what the difference between now, now the, the, the Marxist system says that what he's going to what they're going to do is take all of this money and bring it down here, 
and distributed to all the people here. Everybody, all these people here. See, they said these people here. You got. He says this is this is uh, these people here are saying uh, we 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 rule you. And look who he has. The religious. Uh, this is the king. Got a king there. He's got Congress. I guess the the the, the legislative or people are representing the businessmen. But look, he said we fool you. That's a that's a that's a that's a, 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 a slap at or a kick at the religious leaders of the world. See, there's Christianity represented there. And then he says that this next group, they say that uh, we shoot at you. <laughs> that's the military. And then here it says, uh, this next group here says, uh, we, we eat for you. That's this group here. And this group here says that uh, we work for you. All, we, work, we work for all. And we feed all. In other words, the Marxists say that the uh, communists say that this is where they are. You know, the whole idea is to take all of this, this whole pyramid down from capitalism and spread it out. Everybody's going to have an equal share in this money here. They say that's their system. And the only problem with that is I don't, I, I, there's no such system in the world that has ever been there. Each time, what happens when, it, when they destroy this capitalist system, which, which the Bible doesn't say what type of system that is a, is a is, is, is appropriate because God, Jesus Christ, when he rules, he's a dictator. As for J. Bernard McGee said, the best system is that which ruled by a dictator, his name is Jesus Christ. When he comes back, he will rule with the iron rod. That's the best system. Until then, all the other systems in the world is ruled, is least influenced by the evil one, no matter what it is, capitalism, communism, whatever it is. But unfortunately, the church has, it has engaged the church in such a way that uh, Luther felt the need to try to, or at least uh, uh, separate the church from this whole system, from the capitalist system, from any system. And, and because we are in the body of Christ and we are in the kingdom of the living God, that's where we are. And that's his point. He said, well, his point, he keeps expressing the whole idea that he's not trying to recover America, nor he's trying to uh, make America better or anything about America. He's, his concern is the church. And what God has called us to do primarily is to, to uh, spread the gospel message is what God has called us to do. But uh, uh, we have gotten into many other things that uh, we'll talk about as we go along that perhaps uh, we are being uh, led in a, in a direction that is not biblically sound. So let's, let's continue on here. We'll talk about what pro propaganda is. But many others now, Many others believe, as a, and then note this, as a seed planted in the minds of the of masses against capitalism, it was successful to bring light and actual hierarchy structure of America according to academia. That's what this system here represents. But many other believe that the Judeo-Christian principles written in, in the US Constitution that identifies the creator as one gives inalienable rights to all the citizens of America believe that this is the basis and the principles from which the American system is built on the foundations, at least, at least in principle. I didn't say in practice, I say in principle. Yet, pro yet propaganda is being used today to change the direction of a nation. It is. The question is, what is propaganda? That's what we want to answer the question first. What is propaganda? What is it? Come on in. Okay. okay. We're slow down. What is propaganda? Propaganda is communication that is primarily used to influence or persuade an audience to further an agenda which may not be objective and may be selectively presenting facts to encourage a particular synthesis or perception. Now that's a Wikipedia, you can take that for what Wikipedia say is uh, the definition rather lengthily, uh, but we'll get into it a little bit more in specifics. The propagandist uses loaded language to produce an emotional note now. The propagandist uses loaded language to produce an emotional rather than a rational response to the information that is being presented. And that's a very key. That's, that's, that's a very key to uh, the effects of propaganda of being a propagandist. And so and I, I was I was I was speaking to a pastor this briefly, I saw him uh, this is week I was in the office and he just brief came by it was momentarily, but I thanked him for getting me some help on this on the subject because he talked about 
uh, for First Peter chapter four, because in presenting the scriptures, we know that the, that that in, in uh, Second Corinthians chapter four it talks about the God of this age blinds the people. We know that we cannot be blinded as believers, not by the God of this age. But uh, as Pastor sh 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 shared with us a Sunday, and I, I know you picked up on it, I'm, think, I'm thinking that you did. We can be, uh, all, be, we can blind ourselves. We can blind ourselves by the emotional response to the information that we receive and, and, and render ourselves ineffective as believers. That can be done. Pastor spoke of the distractions of, of social media events and how we become vulnerable to taking some of those thoughts of the enemy and incorporating them into our activity, daily activities. And surely uh, we can we, we can say from, from, from what has happened since we met on Sunday, the leak of the Supreme Court a draft document about abortion Monday surely confirms what Pastor was talking about in First Peter. Many Christians are on both sides, and we don't have no side. We are what God says about abortions. And I'm, this is not this evening is not about abortion. It's not about but although it's part of the propaganda, I'm using it as an example of your actual application of what we're talking about. Propaganda, propaganda. What we do is we learn our, we live our, we live our life based on the word of God, every word that is written out uh, on the word of God. Uh, and that is where the Bible, that's where we uh, get our uh, instructions from and what, what to do and how to live for the Lord. We are to be salt and light in the world. We are to be led by the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, not by propagandists, not by any man or anyone who would come to us with anything other than what the gospel and the Bible say, Paul says in Galatians, let him be accursed. And I won't use the term that if you read in King James, in the New King James, it say let him, let him be accursed. But in the King James, it says, let him be a three-letter letter word written in the scriptures. So he does use loaded language. And sometimes we can get wind up in these loaded language situations and forget about what God has said about this, about his word and what he He's nevertheless holding us accountable. Let's move on. The propagandist uses words like justice, oppression, racism, sexism, homophobia, homophobia, and supremacy to stir up discontent. His whole idea is to stir up discontent. He's got to have discontent. Got to have victims. Got to have victimization because discontent is where he works at best. I didn't know. Now, who is who is who is the one who so the propagandists continue from the moment from both believers and unbelievers so to be that we we will be aware of uh, the strategies of my brothers and sisters of the enemy that's what we're saying tonight that's what we're trying to talk about tonight that's all we're trying to do encourage you along the way this is an anti capitalist propaganda that issued in 1911 now remember this my brothers and sisters please if you don't remember anything else I said tonight the issue. It, the issues are never the issues. Let me say it again. I got it written there. Let me read it properly. The issues are never the issue when it comes down to propaganda. The issue is always revolution. Always change is what they have in mind. And who says that? Saul Alesky, he wrote a book that uh, was used by many in, in Chicago and others who, to do some uh, what they call uh, work, door-to-door uh, -door work and whatnot to, to change into Marxist, to implement, to implement a Marxist system as, as well as could be done as well as he could. He says that he, he dedicates a, cha a chapter in his book to, to the devil, by the way. So this is real. Now, yeah. this is what uh, 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 Dr. Lutzer says, sell it as a noble cause as a propagandist does. They sell their cause as a noble cause. Yeah. Propaganda can change the direction of a nation. And let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 15. I'll read verses one through 12. Well, I, I, I'll really just read from verses one through six. We'll get to the other verses later on. I'll just read 2 Samuel, if you're familiar with this. And note, this is God's people how propaganda changed the hearts and directions of God's nation, affecting God's king. Yes, it, yes, it did. Propaganda. Yes, it is. Words, words. We'll see how it works. Open your Bible. 
to 2 Samuel chapter 15, where I'll read verses 1 through 6, beginning, and we'll come back if we need be. I'll be reading from the New King James translation. After this happened, that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Verse 2. Now Absalom would rise early in and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a for decision that Absalom would call to him and say, what city are you from? And he would say, your servant is from some such and such a tribe of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good to write, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that I were made judge in the land and everyone who has any suit or any cause would come to me then I would give him justice, that's the issue. And so, he, so it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put his hand and take him and kiss him. Oh my goodness, this is, he's, he's top, this is, this is, he's a good politician. Some politicians are using that today. In this manner, Absalom note now, act toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So look, so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. That's uh, what the propaganda can do to change the direction of a nation. Yes, it can. God's chosen people, Judah, is an example of how Absalom, King David's son, stole justice, sold justice, I'm sorry, sold justice as a noble cause and turned the hearts of the nation into rebel or rebel rebelling against God's King David. Yes, he did that by using the propaganda is powerful. And I'm going to share with you uh, just momentarily what I, what I received in the mail about two weeks ago. And, it, and, and what, I'm, what I'm trying to show you is that you may have received one too. How, and you can call it propaganda or you can call it whatever you want. I call it propaganda and we can talk about it. And if you have a, it, it, by the way, if you want to uh, make a comment, all you have to do is raise your hand and just a Paula will let, will, will, will let you speak and then we can go back to uh, uh, the uh, uh, study tonight. And, uh, and I'm just praying that if you have a comment, it's gonna be one of encouragement, not of uh, a distraction, right? And this is what I received in the mail. It says this about two weeks ago. Dear Lawrence, Car dear Al Carpenter, not Lawrence, dear Al Carpenter, throughout our, his throughout our history, enemies of democracy have attempted to silence the will of the people by restricting voting rights and political participation, especially for Black Americans. In the not too distant past, these enemies of multiracial democracy engaged in rampant violence and terror to prevent Black people and other people of color from voting. Today, they are erecting as many obstacles to the ballot as possible to hinder the ability of black voters. Let, let, Latinx, I think I'm talking about Latinos, or Latinx voters, low income voters, young voters, new voters, and voters with disabilities to elect and be represented by the candidate of their choice. On January 6th, the last year, we saw once again the violent tactics of the past thousands of extremists, many bearing the insignia of the white supremacists, which hate groups stormed the U.S. Capitol, building an attempt to stop the certification of the president's vote. But the deadly insurrection did not stop the ongoing legislative attack on voting rights, it had added more fuel. The Southern Poverty Law Center has remained vigilant to the attacks and continues to fight to uphold and protect our precious democracy. And with the support of dedicated individuals like you, we will remain watchful in the coming months ensuring that the necessary actions are taken up to, to put on and put an end to the siege that the previous administration has energized and advanced. Racism requires the conviction of only, no, no, racism requires the conviction of only a few, but it demands the inaction in of many though. If, I, if you feel I, as I do, you will not be counted among the indifferent. Then they told me, they didn't want me to send them some money. So they want me to send them $25 or $35 or $50 or more 
that would help there. Now, I'm gonna come back to this document at the end, because I want you to comment on it. You can decide. You probably, many of you probably received them too. If you receive them, sure, you, I don't know, you have to send it back. It's a lot more to it than that. I just want to share that with you because we're talking about words that are mani manipulative. That's all we're talking about. I'm talking about propaganda, that's all. Yeah, okay. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that I was made judge in the land who has any suit of course, of, or, or, or cause would come to me, then I would give him justice. There it is, justice. That's all he was trying to do was, was he said, as he was selling his noble cause, all he wanted to do really was to establish justice for, the, for, the, for, for Judah and the people in the tribes, the different tribes, the different, different places where they live. That's all he said he was trying to do. What is the purpose of this study then? I know you asked that question. What is the purpose of the Bible study? Why are we even talking about this? That's a good question. To search the word of God, to confirm noble causes and from the will of God. Is it from the will of God or from the will of man? That's why I read you the one, the document that I received. Now I gotta decide, is this, is, is this cause that they just told me, he told me, he, it, it, whoever wrote this, he, he's got a lot more in there in the, to that than that. He got a gram, that, he got graphs and all those graphic pictures and a lot of other things too, but a couple of things are missing. I can tell you right now, he's never talked about Jesus' name in it, nowhere, nor is God. So that's another thing, but I, I don't expect that. So the point I'm trying to make is this. What, why are we studying this? Why do we have this Bible study? To search the word of God to confirm the noble cause, that it, or is it from the will of God or the will of man? That's what we should do. Because we live by the word of God and we live by the leading, leading of the Holy Spirit, no matter what kind of document we receive from home or any place else. We are to obey God and not man. That's what we started off talking about with Peter and John when they were uh, uh, at the temple, lifting up the name of Jesus, which God has called you and I to do on a daily basis. That's the first thing we want to do is to search the word of God to see or to confirm it, if it's so, or if, uh, if, it's, if, if this cause, and many causes out here, but but the cause that we are we are we 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 know what our cause is. Our cause is Christ's cause. That's that's our cause. Why we know what it is. But we live in the world. God expects us to influence the world with, with, with the gospel, not the world influencing us with their causes. There's a difference. Second thing is to seek the identity to identify biblical principles with, when practice when practice will fortify will fortify our hearts. To resist propagandists who sells re rebellious action against God's word as a noble cause, and it can it could be very, it could be a thin line. Sometimes they got very good causes. And matter of fact, the document that I read you has some good causes in it, no doubt about it. Some causes I support, sure, sure. I do. And what he says is true in some in some instances, but not all. You and I know that th things that you do has to be true, not partially true. Anything that is partially true is a lie, according to the scripture. The third thing is to strengthen our faith, that we continue steadfast and unmovable. How are we going to do that? Being led by the Holy Spirit of truth, the only one who can prevent our emotions from blinding our minds. And that's the whole, what, that's the whole essence of really where we are, because we are a people and we live in a nation and a culture that love to respond from an emotional aspect. As soon as someone tells us something, we see something, we woo, we write on it. And guess what? Believers can mind can be blind by their emotions and become irrational in their response to the truth. We're gonna, we're gonna, there's a reason for that. Jesus is gonna tell us that before we finish this study tonight. Believers have been taught from the word of God who the father of proper propaganda is and how to recognize the fruit of his evil works. It's all evil. This is what Jesus said. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand for the truth because there is no truth in him for he is a liar and the father of lies. So we already know who the father of propaganda is. He is the devil. He is a murderer and anyone who comes to you with some type of worthy cause, you're gonna destroy or kill or, or hurt and injure some others 
we know cannot be from God. It's from the Father, the devil, who is the, who, there is no truth, no truth in him. Turn with me briefly to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Gospel of John, chapter 8. Jesus will give us some more information on this whole idea about how to avoid this, or at least how to evaluate ourselves to find out where we are in this, on this uh, Christian walk that we find ourselves in, how to, how to avoid, how to know the truth and, and how to discern the truth from uh, error or from the pop, those who propagandize. Well, the first thing we need to do is search for the evidence to confirm is the noble cause truthful? Is it truthful? Now, here's some biblical principles that we need to think about that Jesus tells the disciples. And by the way, he's talking to religious leaders here. And listen to what he says. There's a reason that some are not responding as they ought to, to the truth. Let's look at uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 8. We'll begin at verse 42. Verse 42 from the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and came from God, nor have I come to of myself, but he sent me. Now, that is the key. And my, my brothers and sisters, we have to fall in love with Jesus, really. Even when your emotions tell you something else, even when you're on television, even when you see the people being hung or beat up and bruised and doing all these other things, you have to love Jesus in order to constrain yourself to help in a, in a helpful way, rather than getting your gun and going out and start shooting people. You might feel that way, but the Bible will never tell you to respond that way unless you're in the military. And the Bible does tell you in the military that you are to fight and kill your in, the enemy, but not as an individual. But you can protect your home. That's another issue. The point I'm trying to make here, though, is that the only thing that can really constrain us, that we might be the salt and light that God has called us to be, is the love of Jesus. we got to fall in love with God. If not, our emotions will overcome us at some point. It really will. Jesus goes on to say this. Why do you, why you do not understand my speech? No, this is the key. Because you are not, you are not able to listen to my word. Why are they not able to listen to your word, Lord? Because their mind has, their hearts have blinded them emotionally. Because they thought the Messiah was going to come and set up his kingdom and establish them as rulers in the world, oh, and they was going to get revenge on the Roman Empire and all the evil and wickedness that the Roman Empire had done to the Jews. And so they were looking forward to that. They knew Jesus had the power to do it. They seen him, they seen him heal people. They seen him do the, do the things that no man could do. Nicodemus came to him in, in Gospel of John chapter 3, says, no man does what, uh, what we see, what we have seen, to paraphrase, what you have done, seen you do. But then when Jesus uh, would not, do what they felt he wanted, wanted, what they wanted him to do. They wanted to make him king right away because they were in physical bondage. But they had a greater bondage, my friend. Their greater bondage was the bondage of Satan. They, they was under the, 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 sure, they was under the bondage of the Roman Empire, but it was under, the, they had a greater bondage. They was under the bondage of Satan, who's, who was the ruler behind the scene of the, of the Roman Empire and all empires in the world, including this one that you and I live in. So what did they do? They became emotionally upset with Jesus till they could not even respond to the truth. And in fact, they hated his person. And that's the key. They hated his person. They sought to kill him. He's going to tell them that. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you cannot, you're not able to listen to my words because my brothers and sisters, you and I know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you are turned on already by anything that I have said tonight, you will not receive any of it at all. But now we have verse 44. This is what he says. You are of your father, the devil. He's talking to the, the, the religious leaders now in, in Israel. As a general, as, 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 as general, he's talking to the religious leaders. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and the de and desires of your father you want to do. Note. The desires of your father you want to do. 
it's interesting that when we become as believers emotionally uh, 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 saturated with, with thoughts that are not of the, of, of the from the Holy Spirit, we too cannot hear the word of God. And, I, and what we want to, then we begin to hear what we want to hear. See, that's what the propaganda, that's what a propagandist does. He, give, uh, he, say, he gives you words so that you want to hear, and, and they are not true, but he, get, he gives them to you. You want to hear them, you receive them. And, and, uh, and let me give you an example. I won't spend much time on it. This prosperity movement. Who don't want to be healed? Who don't want to be wealthy? I do. But I know that's not, I also know that Jesus said, I must take up my cross and follow him daily. Even if I'm healed, I'm going to die. So what is the case? The case is that I'm not going to leave the Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches, Genesis Bible Fellowship, where the word is taught, line on line, precept on precept, and go, down, go around the corner, go down the street, and join in with all these individuals. They got, they got all of these huge uh, places, and they are just praising all of them going to be rich, and they're going to be they're going to be wealthy, but I don't know why they keep going because they, they, they repeat it every week. All Everybody in the church is not wealthy, but why do they come back every week? Because they are saying what they want to hear, my brothers and sisters. They're preaching and teaching for what they want to hear. It's enough to draw them back in again, away from the truth, my brothers and sisters. That's all I'm trying to do, share with you, just warn you, that's all. Let's let Jesus talk. He'll say some things. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks propaganda, a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Now, what is the issue then, Lord? Because I tell you the truth, or because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Why do, why, do, why do they don't why they don't believe the Lord? He said it earlier. Because they won't listen to us, they cannot listen to his word. When they see him, they become upset. They want to kill him. He says that. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe. Which of you convict me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the God's word. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. That's what he said. Of course, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, 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 well, I'll keep on reading before, uh, I'll read on down to verse uh, maybe 51. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. He says this. Then the Jews answered and said to him, do you not answer right, say rightly that we, do not, do you not answer, let me move my, do you not say, say rightly that you are the Samaritan, a Samaritan and have a demon? Do we not do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And that's how they view the truth. The, 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 the word became flesh and was standing right there talking to them. And they call the word of truth a demon. That's how powerful propaganda is to the emotions when the emotions is taken over. And we are led by it, opposed to the truth. What does Jesus say? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Jesus answered, answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you honor me. You dishonor me. Verse 50. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keep my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my, my word, he shall never taste death. Well, I'm going to stop there because what Jesus said, if they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ right then, they could have been saved. Of course, they would have trans. When you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus, they're translating it from death to life. They were already dead in trespasses and sin. They were already under the bondage and the captivity of the enemy. And light came to them, and they rejected the light. That's the issue. And so the enemy had victory over them momentarily. All right, now, the deceitful power of propagandists is to hide his motives by manipulating words. That's what he does. 
the deceitful power of a propagandist, what does he do? He hides his motive, motives by manipulating words. A propagandist sells his noble cause, making a people feel ambivalent, note this, ambivalent to facts or scientific truth by crafting his message to appeal to what they want to hear. Remember just what Jesus said, why can't you hear my word? Can't understand them because you do not want to hear. And what he does is he come along and craft a message to appeal to what they want to hear. No doubt about it. We want to hear that justice is done in every place. No doubt about it. Every, I do, and every one of you I know want to do the same thing. When we talk about ambivalence, what are we talking about? It's a state of having simultaneous conflicting reactions, beliefs, or feelings to what some object. You say, how can it be simultaneously? Okay, well, take the word justice, for instance. The, we, we're confronted with that right now, and we always are. I just read to you, they, they want me to send some money that they, the justice might prevail. Surely we are not being treated justly in every aspect of, of, of where we live, and there's no place in the world where people are treated absolutely uh, uh, just, no place. But we have avenues to appeal. That, that, but, but my justice is going to come from the law. Yes, and if I'm wrong, I'm, Paul teaches us, and we'll get there sometime, depending upon how long we stay together on this subject. Paul te teaches us how to respond to an injustice. The Bible does not say that as believers, we should take, turn the other cheek at, in, in certain contexts when we are being uh, exploited, when we're being uh, abused, you know, when we're being... Uh, uh, arrested and or being would be brutalized by police or any other any other entity that would do us wrong. The Bible doesn't say that we are to, uh, uh, to just be uh, believers and keep on praying. No, it doesn't say that. We, there are things that we can do. Paul demonstrates that. I did not intend to do that tonight to bring it to your attention, but I think I will. Go over to Acts chapter 16, and I, 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 I'll show you what I'm talking about. I want to demonstrate to, 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 to what, we, what we need to do as believers about justice. Because God has given us, the, we're talking about the principles of the Bible that tells us how to react when we are treated wrongly. We'll move to Acts chapter 16. We'll see that. Again, I, 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 the Holy Spirit, I believe, is leading me to, to share with you that we're talking about justice, what justice looked like. God has given us what we are to do as believers. We don't respond the way the people in the world respond. But God has given us a way to respond. Being led by the Holy Spirit is the way we are to respond. We'll see Paul do it, do so. But here we get to Acts 16 when God passes. Acts chapter 16. Of course, we know the story. Paul had tried to get into uh, Europe, and the Holy Spirit has prevented him from going there. He tried to get into Asia, couldn't get in there. And then he saw a man in a Philippi saying, come on over and help us. So he went to Philippi. Of course, we and I know he, get, he, he, he was arrested. Uh, and, and, and what was he arrested for? For preaching the gospel. Really, he wasn't arrested for preaching the gospel, but he was arrested for calling out the uh, little, little slave girl that kept right on following behind Paul and Silas. I mean, he's saying the truth. These men will lead us to talk about God, talking about God. Now, you would think right away that Paul... Uh, would have uh, appreciated it, appreciated what she was saying, but I uh, know. See, she was trying to connect the Bible or the Word of God with demonic entities in, the, in, the, in, her, in her master so that they could take all the power and be, pop, be for religious people as well as non religious and, and be soothsaying and telling, and soothsaying and telling uh, fortunes and gaining for, for money, monetary gain. Let's look at it, verse 16 of chapter 16, verse Acts. Then it happened, of chapter 16 of, chapter, of, verse 16 of, chapter, of chapter 16 of, and verse 16 of the Acts of the Apostles. Now it happened, verse 16, now it happened, as we went to pray that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who bought her masters much profit and fortune telling. That's the key, profit. This girl followed Paul and us. Now, of course, uh, Luke is with him at this point and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, if, we, if I go out tomorrow and see someone out there saying this, 
I would probably be deceived and thinking that the person was of God until I check. But what we're talking about, we're talking about evidence and confirmation. That's what we're talking about here right now. And this she did for many days, not one day or two days, for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Yes. The demonic spirits know scripture and was, and was, and was, but what was he trying to do? He was connect, connect himself to every convert or any other, the church that Paul, that the Holy Spirit was going to raise up there in Philippi. He's going to connect that to, to the, to his, to their, to their uh, business and profit and profit from that also. But when the master saw their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the market place to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly troubled our city. Now, now, now he continues racial thing. So these are Jews, that's racist. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Roman to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrate tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten and with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison commanding the jailer to keep them secretly, or some sorry, securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. The only thing these men were doing was preaching the gospel, that's all. But look what happened. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. Many of you know this story, but it's worth looking at when we're talking about confirmation of a cause. The cause here is the gospel and the spreading of the gospel to the unsaved, that's Paul's call. That's the cause. Suddenly there was a great, verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loose. And the keeper of the prison awakened from sleep and seeing the prisoner's doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. The Paul called out, called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the call of every believer to an uh, unbeliever, to share the gospel. And it says, what must I do to be saved? That's the, that's the key. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of, to, of, to the, of the Lord to him and uh, all who were in, the, in his house. And he took them the same hour of the, uh, of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into the house, he set food before them and he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. Now here's what happened. This is what I'm really trying to get to. I want to give you that introduction, but here's the real issue. What are we to do when we are defeated? When, to when we seek justice as believers, what, are, what, is, what does the scripture say we ought to do? And when it was day, the magistrates sent for officers, sent the officers saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported that these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have, have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans. Paul said, this is how believers are seek justice and have thrown us into prison. And now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. Then the officers told these words to the magistrates and they were afraid that they heard that they were Romans. Paul had a right to Every, uh, everything that was offered to a Roman citizen and, and Roman citizens were not to be flogged without a hearing, of course. But what did he do? Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. Paul did not respond to what they said. This is what he said, this is what he did. So they went out to the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and they departed. 
you see, when what did Paul do? He did not uh, uh, say, okay, they released us. We'll just go right on preaching the gospel and, and, and we will uh, leave it up to the Lord. He will judge them eventually. No, he didn't do that because no one is, God has not put us here to be abused, but he's put us here to share the gospel and to stand up for justice. Surely God is the God of justice. But the question is, what is justice? And the propagandists have used justice in the words itself uh, to uh, uh, it, it elicit some kind of emotional response, especially to believers in, where, in culture where we live, until uh, sometimes uh, uh, we become uh, 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 drawn into their, 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 their propaganda in a certain way that it does not glorify God. What did this do? This glorified God. Paul glorified God here, and he, what did he do? He established a church separate from this demonic uh, 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 fortune teller people. They was, he didn't want them to have no association with the church, church whatsoever. And he also established a church so that it could not be attacked by the Roman officials. See, see uh, uh, this particular church, Philippi is one of the most uh, extreme uh, out, uh, outposts of Rome from, from, from Rome, from the Roman government. But they had all the rights that the citizens of the Roman, of the Roman governments had. In fact, some of the Roman, uh, uh, if you study the history, they, they lived there, some of the soldiers they had, a, because there wasn't enough Jews that didn't have a synagogue. You gotta have 10, 10 to have a synagogue. That's why they was down by the water, you know, having their service, Lydia, before Paul came. So the whole point is that God had established, A, a church there, B, that the government could not in, 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 insert its authority over it, and he did so by, 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 by demanding justice. So we are with, we, can, we demand justice, but that is the way to do it. When, I, when I'm talking about ambivalence, what I'm saying, it is the experience of having an attitude towards someone or something that contains both positive and negatively combined measured components. And that's where we become vulnerable to our desires. As I said before, let me say it again. When I'm talking about using the word ambivalence, what am I talking about? It is the experience of having an attitude towards someone or something that contains both positively and negatively combined measured components. That is obeying Romans chapter 13 versus uh, being mistreated and, and being brutalized and, 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 sticking, and, and seeking up by rights. Or similarly, we have a right in this nation as believers to assemble it, and, and so the government has, this is a right that, it, that this constitution has allowed us. So we can assemble like anyone else and everyone else, Christians do, can do so. Sure we can. I haven't seen any place where the, where the government, where, where the scripture encourages us to assemble as a, as a group to protest. I haven't seen that. Paul, 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 Paul was a, he approached, he, he approached the, Roman, the uh, Roman authorities based on his own Roman citizenship. He didn't summon anyone to come in there to his aid. Not at all. But because we live in a different government that has different rules, we can assemble. Christians can assemble. Sure we can. No one can tell us not to. We can speak out too. We, have, we can speak a word of God and no one, well, they can, they, they, they're trying to shut, shut us down and silence us. And that's why, that's why the, this man has written a book. But, but we, we will not be silenced. But, but when we are, when we have these balancing, trying to balance these, uh, these are two, into these two separate uh, components of whether we are going to uh, share the gospel. We can always share the gospel first, but, then, but, but when it comes down to uh, being silent, we won't be silent. I mean, the government can't force us to be silent on any issue, whether it's abortion or whatever it is. We cannot be silent. But we are vulnerable to our own desires because some propagandists will come along and manipulate his words in a certain way and then and, and gin us up to our emotions, and we can forget even the scientific proof or, or even other things that can happen. We won't hear that because he'll tell us what we want to hear. Some of us will, will be, be vulnerable to that, but we pray that you will not do so. Another, another definition of, of ambivalence is to refer to a situation where mixed feelings of a more general sort are experienced. Or where, or where a person experienced uncertainty or indecisiveness. I believe it or not to ever be that way, but we and I know that happens sometimes. And I know that many of us are 
really in that state. And, I, and this is not, and I don't try to persuade you one way or the other, but there's a time when uh, you have to stand and having done all stand, but you have to be led by the Holy Spirit when they stand and never to be quiet, but, but, but there's a way to make your witness and make your presence known at all times that we are the children of the living God. We are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So why should we take a back from anyone, but then we can't allow pride to mix in with our feelings on a certain situation or circumstances in general, like, uh, like crime, for instance, that's a, general, that's a general response to how we respond to crime. That's a mixed feeling. Some of us know that many of us have been put in prison with no charges, laid and stayed in jail, no, because we had no money, no bail. But is that a reason to let everybody out? Because the, the, peop, the prison had more people in it than what, what, what some people believe the propaganda say should. Whoever, <laughs> well, I'm not gonna go down that, road, that rabbit trap tonight, but the whole point is, I know I can say some things that cause your feelings to be mixed up, mixed about certain situations. Surely we won't want anybody to remain in prison that shouldn't be there, but there are some people that need to be there. But no one will, people are reluctant to say that. I, I'll say it because it's true. What is a noble cause? Well, the cause of an event, usually a bad event, is the thing that makes it happen. In other words, uh, we'll see, I'm going back to the biblical account of uh, 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 Absalom, we'll see what we're talking about. The bad event, what was the bad event as, as, uh, as, as we look at uh, Absalom's situation? The bad event was, of course, as he saw it, was in, an injustice. As he said, there's no, there's no the event, the bad event was there's no justice. And, and his, his answer was, the propagandist's answer was, there was no deputy king. Now, I don't, I don't know, I've never read in where, where there has ever been such thing. And, and, and a matter of fact, I know in the Bible, there's no such thing as a deputy king. He created a situation for himself. But now, note that we're talking about, the first point was to search for the evidence to confirm, is the cause noble? Or is it truthful? Well, look at verse, look at, look, go back over to 2 Samuel, uh, uh, verses 15. There's some obvious situations here about this man that these people who responded to him should have known about. When he was talking to each one of them from various places, he claimed that if he was a judge, he would, they would get justice. He had already done some things. Uh, if they had really checked up on and confirmed that this man was not uh, a man to be listened to. Uh, if you look at uh, chapter 15, verse one says, after this, it happened. After what? Look at verse uh, chapter 14, begin at verse 28. And Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, but did not see the king's face. Of course, uh, the story of him, of course, and we're not going to have time tonight to get into it, but the point is that he killed his brother after his brother Edmund had uh, raped his sister. He went away. He should have been when he came back. He really was to be disciplined at the gate. And they could have put him to death for murder, but instead he stayed away, ran away, went down and stayed with his uh, relatives for a while. And then uh, he was convinced by, by his cousin to talk to the king to let him come back, which the king allowed him to come back, return to Jerusalem, but he didn't see him right away. But ultimately he saw him. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, by not seeing him, the king did not necessarily do what God had wanted him to do because he was caught up in the emotions of his son. He loved Absalom. And, and, and he is an example. Even King David got caught up in his emotion with his son. He loved Absalom. And some believers, some, uh, some writers, some uh, those who studied the scriptures and some, uh, some Bible scholars believe that uh, based on his, uh, his response that he had in mind that Absalom would be king one day. You know, well, we know that God told Sol told and told him to make Solomon king. But it seems that, they, that David had in mind Absalom. He loved Absalom. See, sometimes our love and our emotional, again, can get involved in our, in our rational thinking, even for the king. But there was no such thing as a deputy king. <laughs> when, he, when he said that, they should have known, oh, oh this is not on up and up. You know, what, he is, what, is, what, is, what his situation is, and that is not on up and up. Not true. 
a propaganda. What is a noble cause? That, what was a noble cause that he that he espoused to? He, 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 the, his, his noble cause really changed the nation. It temporarily changed the direction of the nation. It really did. And we're talking about God's people and God's nation. That's how strong propaganda is, or lies, if you wouldn't call it that. To that. It temporarily changed the, God, the nation, God's, God's nation. This is what he said to those he spoke to. Oh, that I were made judge. Now, he said he just want to make judge, but I'm going to tell you something. He was already performing that as, as one who was noble. Note the people came to him and bowed down to him. Look at, look at, verse, look at verses one and two. All. This man was already doing some things that right away let you know that he was about himself and not about the people that he claimed that he represented. And that's an issue in our community. There are many who say they are for us, but it's always this elite group. But they also uh, they 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 always benefit from the things that uh, of 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the things that they say they for us to 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 receive. They benefit greatly from them, but very rare that uh, those there on the bottom really raise themselves up, raise up to their level, and they they pick and choose the winners, and it's the same group. They keep 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 being, being uh, uh, recycled through the system while the others drift away. But let's look at the situation here. Now Absalom would rise up. No, no, what he did, he he provided himself with chariots and horsemen and fifty to run before him. That is the position of royalty and of a king. That is not the position of a person, not even a deputy king, not even a, a judge. That is definitely not the position of a judge. They should have known that but they didn't confirm whether or not his cause was noble. That's the whole idea. You gotta confirm these things. Can't be just drawn away by what he said. Although he, say, he said what they wanted, just wanted to, he talked to them about what their issues were. Their issues were, I took my, I had a legal case. If you look at the word, really it talks about legalism, a legal case. They had a legal case and they thought that their case was not heard or adjudicated and they didn't get no justice. Matter of fact, they, what, the case was dismissed. He would get to them and tell them, of course, if I was a judge, I would help you out. I would, I would hear your case, your, your case. You got a good case. And it seemed like he was talking to them. Yeah, what's your case? Yeah, you could win this case. I'm just, I don't want to put too much into it. The point I'm trying to make is this. He himself, though, was more than what he said he was as he represented himself to those individuals by looking at him. He said, you had a lawsuit to the king, he said, for, for a decision that Absalom would call to him and say, what city are you from? And he would say, your servant is from each, from such and such a tribe of Israel. But Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good. That is, and right. See, the whole idea, you good, this is cause. He's, he's, he's trying to put into their heart that, that this whole idea that, 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 that what he's doing is, is a noble cause for truth. But there is no deputy of the king to hear you. That's what he says. But then he goes on to say some other things. Oh, that I was made judge. Look at verse four. More will Absalom would say, oh, that, and this, this, is a, this is an expression, that I was made judge in the land and everyone who has a suit or a cause come to me that I would give them justice. There it is, justice. Justice, and that's what the paper was talking to me that I received was about justice. It was about justice, it was about justice. Now, what was, it, what was his ambition? His ambition really was to be king. His ambitions, that was his ambition all along was to be king. And he was willing to kill his dad, the king for power. Now, let me say this, those who are under the sway of the enemy, in First John chapter five, verse 19, their main goal with those who will excel themselves is for power. They're not for political expedience to help others, many of them, they're few, they're not all in the system today. Now there were some, some of old who were really believers who were in various positions and that's how we influence this culture for, for Christ. We have to be in, in positions and we have to stand for, the, for, for what is true and for what is right and do it regardless of the outcome. And we've got to be willing to suffer for it if, it, if, if, if it need be. But our whole goal wouldn't be as the world is to perceive power. But this is what 
this, this Absalom's ambition, and I think I can prove that from the scripture, that his whole ambition was to seek power. Okay, look, I'm going to finish reading now this particular part of the scripture. And so it was, whenever anyone, verse five, came near to, the bow, he, to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. And I don't want to go too far with this, but you see, there are some who can come on and tell you that they know, I know how you, I know your feeling. I know exactly what you feel. I was one of you. I know what you feel and I know that this is that. Then there's some others who are brash you. You got, you got to, don't, don't, don't pay no attention to what they say. This is what they do because both of them are for power. One, I see, one seeking it one way, the other one seeking it the other. One want to appeal to your emotions that you might be emotionally attached to him, a good old person. The other one is a wretched, and you know he's a wretched and an evil one. You might reject it, but that, look, don't be persuaded by either one. Stay with the word of God and cause each confirm their noble cause, no matter what their mannerisms are. Confirm their noble cause from the Bible. If their noble cause does not fit in the scripture, within the principles of the Bible, then you and I know that they are from the evil one, and the evil one persuades them all. So let's go on and read it. Yeah. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to him for judgment. What did he do? He stole the hearts of the men of Israel. That's the whole idea of, of, of everyone who do use propaganda. It's to steal the hearts of the individuals who he's talking to, let them know that his, 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 his cause is noble, to get them to come and join with him. Some of them are, some of them are not. You have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Well, your servant took a vow while I dwelt in Gershon. And this is what he said. <laughs> he went to the king and lied to the king. Now it came to pass after four years now, not 40 years, four years, that Absalom said to the king, please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to look to the Lord. And he lied on the Lord. Well, your servant took a vow while I dwelt in Gesher, Gesher in Syria. That's where he went and stayed with his relatives uh, for while he was away after he killed his brother. If the Lord indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. That's, he, make a, he said, the Lord bring him back, he'll serve the Lord. And the king said to him, go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. What did he do? Then Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men invited from Jerusalem, and they went along innocently and did not know anything. And that's where many believers fall. We will go along with these individuals who appeal to us, and they lie to us, and we, we, we're innocent in a certain way. We did not know anything because what, the first part we wanted, we said tonight was while, while we studied this lesson, we want, to, we want the evidence to confirm is the cause noble or not, or is it truthful? Then Absalom sent for Ahithophel, to the, 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 the guild of the night, David's counsel from his city, <laughs> from Gilead, from Gilead, while he offered sacrifices and the conspiracy grew stronger for the people with Absalom continued to increase in numbers. It was stopped right there. Of course, you and I know the story. Ultimately, he chased the king out of, out of off the throne, changing the direction of the people in the nation of God, just temporarily. But if you read it on further, it will say it's God's plan. Because God had a plan to do, do to, 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 to judge him for his for his for his uh, actions. Yes, he did. Cause, cause is to, listen, what, when we talk about cause, what we talk about, cause is to be, to give rise to, or cause a new state in something. Being right, be right, be just. That's what, that's what he said in verse 14. All right, now I'm gonna end with uh, just a few notes from, uh, from, from uh, uh, Dr. Lutzer, who talks about this whole idea of justice. This is what he, this is what he said about this whole idea about justice and propaganda. This is what he, this is what he says. He says, uh, often an, uh, an arguments are set aside for people who believe that what they want to believe even in the face of mounting contrary evidence. 
Someone has said that ultimate, the ultimate goal of propaganda is that we behave like a child with a, with a finger in each ear shouting, I don't hear you. <laughs> and when the radicals do hear a viewpoint that challenges their beliefs, they then dox the person who is saying it. They attempt to find some damning personal information about the person and put it on social media. This conveniently cancels the need to deal with the issue that challenges their thinking. In other words, I don't like the message, so I will just destroy the messenger. Their response is outraged rather than rational arguments. We'll see a lot of that in the weeks to come. Outrage arguments, outrage on this one, outrage. We'll see that a lot this week and months to come. No, only the powerful, only the power of the pro, of, 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 sorry, only the power of pro, pro, propaganda can amount account for movement that clamors for defending the police and vilifying law enforcement officers as great threats to our society, while at the same time executing or even defending archaeists. And I'm sorry, and, and, and archaeists. All this is happening at a time when crime rates are spiking in our cities, and people feel that they will have to defend themselves when mobs arise in their door. The destruction of the law and order is sold under the banner of progress, of progress, and of course, the very noble goal of justice. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege of sharing in your word. We pray, Lord, that you will let, being let, that cause us to be led by the Holy Spirit for when we are led by the Holy Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so we are people who love you, we desire to serve you, we want to encourage one another. And I pray that this message will, the study will encourage us and not discourage us because we are, we are in for it in this in weeks to come with propaganda from all sides. Gird our hearts up, strengthen us, Lord, that we might stand and having done all, stand on your word. We thank you again for the privilege of sharing with your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.